So tonight, I am going to be telling you all a little bit about rabies. <laughs> I'm also going to tell you why I think Edgar Allan Poe probably died of rabies. And when I was approached to speak <laughs> at the salon, the curator came at me with a handful of topic suggestions, and one of them was this one. And I was pretty excited to do this one because, and I, I don't like to brag, but as a very small child, I was irrationally afraid of rabies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm the one in polka dots on the left. This is me a few years before what I call my rabies years. <laughs> and I would have chosen a picture closer to that time, but I was much cuter when this picture was taken. So to give you an idea of what you would have been seeing if I had picked a picture closer to that time, do you know how a daddy long legs is like 8% like stupid fat little body? <laughs> And the other 92% is like these lots and lots of long, knobby, scrawny legs. It was like that, but with buck teeth. <laughs> yeah, but hopefully it's all turned out okay. <laughs> that was a cheap, and I'm, thank you for indulging me. Um, <laughs> There were two good reasons why I was afraid of rabies, and the first is that humans are terrible at risk assessment. <laughs> to give you a modern example of this with my own life, I will happily stuff my diseased sausage fingers into my mouth multiple times a day, every day, knowing that fingers are the commuter train of poop particles. <laughs> I'll still do it. You'll probably see it tonight, if you're lucky. And the second reason why I was so scared of rabies is because it's in a surprising number of children's books. It's in To Kill a Mockingbird, which I think I can safely assume every single person in this room has read. It's also in Julie's Wolf Pack, which I think I can also safely assume no one in this room has read, except me. Ooh. Meet me after the break, okay? Let's talk. Okay, we got three. It's also in the, the Ferrari of rabies literature, Old Yeller. <laughs> yeah. Sorry if I brought up hard memories for any of you. Sorry. It was written in the 50s. What do you mean too soon? <laughs> When is not too soon? So let's learn a little bit about rabies. Rabies is an ancient disease. We have been writing about rabies for thousands of years. And the word for rabies in languages throughout the, word, the world shares the same linguistic roots with words like rage, to go crazy, or to do violence. And historically, the only thing our ancestors really understood about rabies is that you get it uh, by being bitten by an infected animal, most often a dog. And we weren't even like 100% sure about that, uh, as you will see in the future during this talk. We just weren't sure about that, and our opinions on that kind of fluctuated throughout time. And since we were so uh, unsure about how rabies worked, the methods of treatment that we had were pretty wild. One of my all-time favorites comes from the Middle Ages. And if someone was bitten by a dog that someone thought was rabid, you take a rooster and you would pluck the feathers from around the anus of the rooster. Mm -hmm. And then you would take that fresh, probably very pink rooster anus, and you would apply it to the bite site. Yeah. Light science, let's not give it more credit than it's due. So for any of you who might have been getting a drink or were looking at pictures of Meryl Streep on your phone, whatever you do to fill the time when you don't want to be present in your body, I want all of you, if you take nothing away from this fact, this, this talk, 
People used to take rooster anuses and put them on open wounds. So if you didn't have rabies before that, you had something by the time that was over. And one person who, as far as my research indicated, has never used anuses in his pursuit of rabies medicine is Louis Pasteur. And he was an early proponent of germ theory, and he developed the rabies vaccine in 1885. Mm -hmm. And in prepping for this talk, I discovered that most of the people I was chatting with, when they'd be like, what are you up to? And I'm like, rabies. And they're like, I don't know anything about that. It's like everyone didn't go through a rabies phase or something. The people that I was talking to, they didn't, they didn't know anything about rabies, which isn't surprising because I was talking primarily to people in the United States. And it's not really something we have to deal with here, and that's primarily because of this guy. Uh, yes. Dogs have historically been the major vector of rabies uh, to human beings. So because we as a society have decided that we are going to aggressively vaccinate all of our pets, we have dramatically decreased the spread of rabies uh, to human beings where we live. And nowadays, bats are the primary vector. Uh, but to give you an idea still of how small of an issue this is for us, 2006 was a really bad year for rabies in the United States, and a grand total of three people died. So I think we're doing OK. So I wanted to get that uh, reassurance out of the way before I dive into what rabies does because it's pretty horrifying. <laughs> so rabies is a virus. It enters your body through the saliva of an infected animal when it bites you. And it's one of the only uh, infectious agents that travels via the nerves. And it does that so it can get to your spinal cord. Once it gets to your spinal cord, it makes its way up to your brain. When it's in your brain, it's kind of like uh, a gremlin on an airplane. Like, it just starts ripping pieces out and throwing them away. So you become like an empty walking husk of the person that you were before. Yeah. And the time between when you are bitten and you exhibit your first symptoms uh, can vary depending on the affected species. Uh, and it, even more interestingly to me, uh, based on how far the bite is from the head. So if you get bitten on the foot, it takes a much longer time to get up to the brain than if you get bitten on the neck. And uh, in human beings, it can take up to a year from between the time you're bitten to when you can exhibit symptoms, which is why only 27% of people ever remember being bitten at all. And if you're the type of person who, despite me reassuring you that you're not going to get this thing, you're still worried about this, I just want to assure you that I have even worse news for you. <laughs> So in addition to having a horrifyingly long gestation period, the early symptoms of rabies are really nondescript. So any hypochondriacs in the room might want to cover their ears. <laughs> These symptoms include a general feeling of illness, fever, headache, nausea, vomiting, and depression. <laughs> so it's like a bad mental health day with some food poisoning thrown in. <laughs> so the, the symptoms I just listed are uh, what you can expect in the time before the virus has gotten to your brain. Once it gets to your brain, things change a bit. Uh, what you can expect now, when it's in your brain, is stomach pain, anxiety, restlessness, fever, increased aggression, sore throat, excessive salivation, hallucinations, delirium, sporadic pulse, you will fall into a coma and die. Additionally, you will experience what is called hydrophobia. And hydrophobia, as the name implies, is a fear of water. It's brought on because the virus has a vested interest in you not drinking water. So when you try to swallow, the muscles in your throat contract so violently and it's so painful that you associate that horrible feeling with drinking water, and you therefore become afraid of water. And this fear, of course, is only exacerbated by the fact that your brain is completely uh, falling apart by the time the virus enters your brain and these symptoms emerge, you have about four days left to live. Now, 
Rabies, as we learned earlier, is not really an issue any of you are going to have to deal with if you stay in the U.S., but that was not the case in Edgar Allan Poe's time. He lived from 1809 to 1849, and if you're good at memorizing things and numbers, you will realize that's about 40 years before Pasteur's vaccination was available. There were some other things going on when he was alive that made rabies an issue. Uh, one of them is that the Industrial Revolution meant there was an increase in the middle class and more people could own dogs. Additionally, people didn't really understand how rabies was spread. It's really hard to prevent something from becoming a pandemic if you don't understand why it's happening. People, for instance, thought that it happened spontaneously in dogs, the major vector for transmission to human beings. And the reason people thought this happened was because they thought the dogs weren't getting the opportunity to bone enough. <laughs> yes. They thought sexual frustration was what caused rabies. And these same people had a really interesting suggestion for what to do about that. Mm. And I can't believe I'm about to say this in front of such a nice group of people. In fact, I kind of don't want to say it in front of Edgar. So I think we'll just, okay. The solution to sexual frustration causing rabies in dogs was in effect mandatory doggy bordellos. Yes. You would bring a young male dog to the doggy madam's place of business and he would get all the rabies out of his system. Then you would immediately neuter him and he could be sold as a pet. Oh, and also, just to make sure he didn't get rabies, that wonderful pet that you just took into your home, two years after buying him, you had to have him killed. Wow. So that's out of the way we can let Eddie listen again. It's time to talk about how he died. He left for New York City from Richmond, Virginia on September 27th in 1849, and uh, he complained of feeling ill and having fever-like symptoms when he left. He also was in a depressive state of mind. He ended up in Baltimore. He was found on October 3rd in a local tavern. He was barely conscious. and He was bodily carried to a local hospital where for the next couple of days he underwent a series of really wild swings in his physical state. At times he was unconscious. At times he was delirious and hallucinating and talking to shapes on the walls. Uh, at points he was lucid and able to talk to the people in the hospital. He wasn't super coherent, but he was able to carry on a conversation. Uh, and at other times he was in an agitated delirious state that was so intense that two nurses had to keep him in his bed, physically restrain him. And he finally fell into a coma-like state and died after four days. And the symptoms he exhibited were very similar to a number of delirium mark disorders, uh, things like yellow fever and malaria and a state of extreme alcohol withdrawal called delirium tremens. Uh, the difference with those is that when you're dying from any of those disorders, your physical state deteriorates in a very linear way. You don't get better at any point. And Edgar Allan Poe's time in the hospital was a lot of swings back and forth. At one point, it looked like he was actually getting better, and that is something that's entirely unique to rabies. Now, we are never gonna know exactly why he died. There was no autopsy taken at the time of his death, uh, but he died in a very miserable way, and what he died of looked an awful lot like rabies. And in doing the research for this talk, I was struck by how much people through the centuries have lived in fear of this thing. I mean, this was the reality for people for hundreds of years in the Western world, and this is still something that people deal with in the East. In India and Russia, this is a really big issue. And I was just struck by the suffering that people experienced. And I'm going to admit that in doing this talk, it was hard at times to find humor uh, to insert into this thing. I really struggled. Based on your reactions, I would say I succeeded. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Casey. Uh, but it was, it was hard. And for me, the surprise MVP of this talk was Louis Pasteur. And I wish I would have, could have talked about him more. But the work that he and the people in his lab did to develop the rabies vaccine put all of them in very real danger every day 
for years on end. They had to extract saliva from rabid animals that were actively trying to attack them to create this vaccine that where it's available in the world today has made rabies a non-issue. There's a reason that no one in this room has ever had it and died from it. And that's because of this guy. And I think that that is worth a toast. So here is to Louis Pasteur and the very real work he's done to reduce the amount of suffering that we have in the world we live in today.